Okay, enough sex for one day. Okay, we'll move on. Okay, um, the last two days we've heard very convincing stories that uh, coral reefs are under serious threat. And not only that, the, with that threat and with that reduction in coral comes a reduction in the quality of the habitat. Um, the question is, how will fishers respond to that decline or change in the habitat that they face? What I'm going to try and convince you today of is that habitat disturbance can lead to sublethal effects and that these sublethal effects can have dramatic, a dramatic influence on the processes that govern not only populations but communities. Okay, great. Excellent. Okay. Okay. Okay, well, oh, that's interesting. I haven't seen it. Um, with with uh, CO2 induced climate change, there are going to be changes in habitat. Uh, okay, one of those is obviously coral bleaching, and we've heard a fair amount about coral bleaching in the last few days as well. And of course, coral bleaching is supposed to increase not only in frequency but in magnitude. With, with that coral bleaching comes a change, obviously, in the coral community and the percentage of coral that is actually there. And you can see down the bottom here... <laughs> okay, I'm going to sit on my hands. You can see down the bottom there... I'll put them in my pockets. <laughs> that, um, that's, a, that's an excerpt from a paper by Jeff Jones and colleagues from some work in uh, Kimby Bay in Papua New Guinea where we had substantial uh, changes in coral um, communities due to coral bleaching and the effect of sedimentation. The coral communities were spectacular when we first went there, sort of 80% on average coral cover. And within literally the space of six years, changed to about 7% coral cover. Now with that change, dramatic change in coral cover, came really quite a spectacular, and we called it catastrophic change in the, in the fish communities, with about 75% uh, of the species showing significant declines of the species that we were counting. So we have a change in the coral, the coral community and with that we have a change in the fish community patterns as well. As corals change uh, fr from being really quite common to being more fragmented and being more patchy, then we are going to get a, a change in the, the uh, fish community associated with those corals. Initially it will be those fishes that need corals will move on to the corals that are available. You can imagine then that there will be changes in the interaction regime that we might, might actually find those fishes under, and that's going to cause them physiological stress. Okay. Climate change oriented bleaching is not the only stress that these, um, these communities are actually, uh, actually face at the moment. And um, um, Malcolm was very good at introducing uh, uh, the importance of agricultural runoff and urban runoff to uh, particular. And the effect that has on turbidity, the effect that has on sedimentation levels, those sorts of things. Like I'm going to the toilet or something. <laughs> okay, we do have a real problem also with pesticides, and that's going to be a long lived problem because a lot of them um, bioaccumulate in the uh, system. Um, not only that, yeah. we have predictions also through uh, changes in current regimes that um, hypoxia in, in some ocean basins is going to increase dramatically. Um, I was in a, a number of conferences in Europe recently and they said, well, what about acidification? That's not our problem. Hypoxia is going to be a real problem. So uh, over in, in many of the uh, basins in... Um, in um, Atlantic, we are going to have a real problem with hypoxia and a lot of uh, research is being put into that. Of course, over-harvest is always going to be a pertinent issue, particularly in coral reefs where we have sex-changing fishes and our harvesting tends to focus on larger fishes, which inevitably happen to be males. So when we start extracting large numbers of males from a uh, population which usually has relatively Males, we are influencing the social system. We're influencing the stress on that system as well, and that social organization. So stress is going to be important. If we're going to understand stress at a population level, we need to understand stress at an individual level. <laughs> 
When we're talking about fissures, the physiological mechanisms underlying stress are really quite well known. Vertebrate um, endocrinology is fairly conservative. It's fairly well conserved across um, the, all vertebrates. If uh, a vertebrate is stressed, it produces glutocorticoids such as cortisol, um, and, and, and we, we can look at um, uh, simple organisms, or well, simple organisms reptiles right through to uh, complex organisms like us in stressful situations we produce glutocorticoids as well. What isn't known so well is the ecological impacts that these stresses are likely to have and that's what we've been focusing our attention on in the last few years. We're dealing with stress, we're dealing with the parental influences on the following generations, yeah? It's a, it's, a, it's a breeding individuals that are going to be influenced by environmental stress, and it's those environmental stresses that are going to influence the next generation through the parents. So if we're dealing with something like replenishment, then we're not only dealing with the number of uh, potential larvae that are coming back to a reef, but also the quality of those organisms that are getting liberated from reefs, because it's the quality that will influence who survives and who dies. So what we've been trying to look at in the last couple of years really is how stress might imp impact the quality and survival of the offspring from fish populations when they're coming into stressful situations. Okay, as I said, if we're interested in how the environment influences the next generation, then we've got to be influenced interested in parental effects, and in particular, of course, maternal effects, because it's the mother that devotes the most energy to the next generation. Of course, there's going to be a genetic component, but there's also going to be a non-genetic component, and it's that non-genetic component, shown here in red. <laughs> Any success there? Okay, okay, there we go. Okay, it's that non-genetic component, which of course is vitally important because it's that component to, for example, nutrition, metabolism, and development that is the link between what the, uh, the breeding population experiences in terms of their environment and how they allocate their resources to their offspring into the, in the next generation. Yeah? So we've, we've uh, spent quite a lot of energy looking at um, non-genetic effects. Okay, good. Okay, so stress, whether it be through environmental influences or uh, changes in habitat or changes in social organization, is filtered through the sensory system and uh, it influences the endocrinology of the animal through the hypothalamus pituitary axis. If we're in stressful situations, then the glutocorticoid cortisol is produced by the interrenal gland and it courses through the blood system. Yeah? It ends up during gametogenesis lodging in the developing oocytes. Okay, so really, with a similar amount in the females, you get a similar amount in the uh, developing oocytes. We know from uh, work we did in the um, uh, early 2000s that um, cortisol directly influences developmental rhythms. So if a female produces eggs and that female is stressed and those eggs have larger amounts of cortisol, then the developing embryos just jit around more. When they start developing muscle blocks, they move around more when they're still in the egg. Okay, so what happens for a fixed aliquot of energy is they end up just expending more energy, just jittering around. Okay, it's just like they're on, you know, some sort of upper. Um, and so they have less energy to put into growth, so they end up being smaller. So more stressed females end up producing smaller offspring. Okay, here's a bit of data that we have bit of data that you can see better than I can, that we have from um, a paper we, we published last year where we've got female stress levels there represented as ovarian cortisol, and we can see that there's a negative relationship between the ovarian cortisol, the stress levels of the females, and the size of the larvae that she ends up producing. Now, those four dots there are treatment means. Okay, we've manipulated the levels of stress that those females are under manipulating social interactions that she will have in the field. Okay? We've got a number of data sets, both in the lab and in the field. They all show exactly the same trend. And you can see here that maternal stress accounts for about 88% of the variability in the standard length of the larvae that she ends up producing. 
Okay. Interestingly enough, that accounts for virtually all of the variability in larval size that we can find around a normal reef. Probably, potentially, ecologically important. Okay, when we've got these little larvae sitting around here, okay, this is not to scale, they're about three millimetres long, okay, we have an idea now what influences their quality, yeah? We don't, and unfortunately, though, we can't track them through time. So the next time we get to see them is when, some three weeks later, when they've developed through the pelagic environment and we get the survivors caught in light traps when they're just about to settle. It's the black box of, the, of larval processes. We don't know, we really haven't got a clue what is going on, whether there is this link between female stress environment and whether it goes through to larval size and that influences, that larval size influences the survival of the offspring. What we would like to do is have some sort of tag of these individuals, the quality of these individuals, that might give us an idea of whether it matters at all what their initial, uh, initial uh, variability in phenotypes were. So luckily for us, what we managed to find was that there's a nice link between otolith asymmetry and parental stress. And otolith asymmetry can represent a nice tag for parental stress. So for bi bilaterally symmetrical organisms, um, asymmetry represents a record of developmental perturbations. What we can do for the, these poor little fishes, which were once alive and when we caught them and we killed them, um, we can whip out their otoliths and compare the shape of the left to the right and in some way get an index of asymmetry of the organism. Okay, and, and when we do an experiment, we find that asymmetry of the organism, uh, the, the, um, I mean, the, the levels of stress, levels of cortisol within the developing embryo directly influences asymmetry. So it could be a useful tag. Here's the experiment here. We've used uh, eggs from a female in, low, uh, in, in an environment where she has low levels of stress, and we've manipulated the stress regime that those eggs have been in. We know that we can just put them into basically baths of, of seawater with cortisol added to them. They take up cortisol, and we can manipulate the levels of cortisol within naturally occurring limits. So here we've got newly fertilized eggs. We've put them individually into little wells. We've manipulated cortisol in three different levels. We've incubated them for four days, four and a half days. They hatch out. We can get the nice little hatchlings, and then we can squash them. And we can zoom in onto their brains, and we can see those developing... Um, we can see those developing sagity, those developing otoliths, and we can look at the level of asymmetry of those otoliths. When we look at the data, we can see that uh, here we've got down the bottom there um, three levels of cortisol treatment, and we can see there's a direct relationship between the levels of asymmetry we get and uh, levels of cortisol treatment that we've inflicted on those developing embryos. So there is a direct relationship between um, levels of stress, levels of cortisol that those embryos have, have had and um, the levels of asymmetry that they then um, exhibit. So it looks like we have a useful tag. Now, so knowing that we have a useful tag and we have a useful tool, then it suggests, okay, well, how are we going to use this to look at whether stress, maternal stress, influences maybe population replenishment. But what we would predict is that those organisms, those, those larvae that have been in higher stressful conditions might have higher levels of otolith asymmetry and they also might have lower levels of survival than those that have lower levels of asymmetry and have been exposed to lower levels of stress. To look at that, we went to the San Blas Archipelago, or at least one of my students, Dave Wilson, did, and he was light trapping for 18 months um, off the archipelago, and he managed to catch quite a few lizard fishes. So we've got a nice proxy for lizard fish replenishment, and then we whipped out, whipped out the otoliths, or at least Tove Lemberget did, and uh, looked at the levels of asymmetry of those otoliths. And we have a nice relationship there between otolith asymmetry, uh, that's a residualized scale, so we have, um, as we Asymmetrical otoliths here. And um, 
uh, larval abundance, uh, that's our proxy for replenishment. Larval abundance uh, uh, as uh, represented as um, the numbers of larvae coming into light traps around sand blast. We can see that we've got a nice negative relationship. It accounts for 60% of the variability in replenishment. If um, those larvae have high levels of asymmetry, they come from a cohort that, that um, is relatively small. Um, those that, uh, cohorts that are relatively large have relatively low levels of asymmetry. Now, 60% variability is pretty good, particularly for a normal um, field population and a field study, you know, oh, I'm pretty happy with that. But if we divide it into wet and dry seasons, then we get a really quite an impressive relationship. Okay, so here we've got a relationship where otolith asymmetry actually accounts for 97% of the variability in replenishment in the wet season and 70% of the variability in replenishment in the dry season, suggesting that there is actually a really quite a strong link between otolith asymmetry, maybe parental stress, and offspring survival through the larval phase. Now, we've got a similar data set for um, damselfishes on the Great Barrier Reef as well through Monica Galliano's work. So what's the underlying mechanism? What's the mechanism underlying that mortality, that link between parental stress and, um, and uh, larval mortality? Well, we don't really know, unfortunately. So this is the, the, the speculative part of the talk, really. But luckily, we know that the endocrine system of vertebrates is fairly well conserved so, um, uh, in terms of its process. So we can actually glean some interesting insights into the mechanism by looking at what other vertebrates are doing when they are prenatally stressed. When, pre when we um, stress um, royal we, um, um, lab rats prenatally, then they have a depressed immune system. Uh, brown trout have a reduced metabolism when they come from uh, stressed females. And um, Atlantic salmon show growth depression when they uh, have uh, prenatal stress. Field mice um, show lower resilience to subsequent stresses. So we could have a physiological mechanism that links that initial stressor to their survival. We could also have more of a functional link and, and Monica Galliano's work suggests that there is really quite a strong functional link between otolith asymmetry and their ability to respond to sound, reef sounds. Okay? So they respond differently depending on the symmetry of the otoliths. So it could be a functional link. If we look at rhesus monkeys, then prenatal stress lowers motor skills and, uh, and they stop exploring novel habitats. So it could actually influence even navigation. Um, uh, Atlantic salmon par. Um, if you put them into mazes, prenatal stressed um, Atlantic salmon show greater naviga navigational errors. So it could be a navigational problem. They might not be able to just get back to reefs that are appropriate. And, um, and uh, field rats have reduced capacity capacities to learn. So it might even influence their cognitive abilities. Now, these are just speculations but they do give us an insight into what could be an important mechanism, and it means that it gives us an insight also into where we should actually be headed in the future, and we will be headed in the future. Okay, so just to very briefly summarise, maternal stress influenced larval size, and that was recorded, that maternal stress seemed to be recorded as otolith asymmetry, and the asymmetry somehow influenced larval survival through to settlement. So there seemed to be a direct relationship between maternal stress and reef fish replenishment. Now, pre-hatch hatching stress is likely to have a lasting effect on the offspring. Many of the same mechanisms that impacted, that I just went through, that impacted uh, potentially uh, reef fish replenishment might well influence post-settlement success as well. So in that graph I showed you from San Blas, in the cohorts where we had low uh, levels of uh, reef fish replenishment, we had relatively high levels of asymmetry. That suggests that if there is a, is a, due, to, is due to a physiological stress, they might well have lower cognitive abilities, low ability, lower ability to actually just not, not only acquire space, but keep space. They will probably be the competitive subordinate within a social system. Okay, so it might, these stresses might well have very long-lasting effects, but of course that awaits further study.
And lastly, the understanding these sorts of physiological mechanisms, these links between parental influences and the quality and the success of their offspring are going to be fundamentally important if we're going to understand and predict the impacts of present and future stresses on fish populations and communities.